Okay. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Bennett. I'm the curator of maritime history here at the North Carolina Maritime Museum. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you who are here on site and those of you who have tuned in online to watch this, um, I'm going to talk about the historic mullet fishery. And so uh, let's start off by talking about the striped mullet or the jumping mullet. It has a wide geographic uh, distribution throughout the world. It's not just the East Coast, the United States. Um, and uh, typically uh, it's found close to ocean beaches and within the sounds and estuaries, uh, particularly here in North Carolina. And, um, and it, it's, it's, you can easily find these fish for a large portion of the year. And they tend to like uh, sandy or muddy bottoms. Um, and uh, they tend to feed on um, uh, uh, microorganisms, small um, crustaceans, uh, dead organic matter, that, that sort of thing. They're bottom feeders. Um, and uh, they're a schooling fish and they tend to school in the uh, late summer and through the fall, which is their spawning season. Um, they'll start to, to school and move offshore uh, to spawn. Uh, and so traditionally uh, the, the mullet season tends to be around from late August uh, through November. Some years it can go into December um, and uh, at other times, uh, people have fished for mullet um, earlier um, in the year, like July. Um, so a lot of people have heard of the mullet shift or the mullet blow. Uh, this tends to happen in late August, early September, when there is a climactic shift. There's usually a shift in the winds, uh, you know, tends to blow heavily from the south. Uh, during the summer with a lot of warm air. And then that late August, early September, the wind will whip around and start blowing out of the north. And that's usually accompanied by um, drier air and a drop in temperature, which signals to the fish that they need to start uh, their spawning season. And that's when they start to schooling and to, to move offshore uh, to do that. Um, and so the fishing grounds uh, tend to be all along the North Carolina coast, um, but historically um, the most robust fishing has happened between Ocracoke Inlet and the border of South Carolina. Um, there's also been heavy um, fishing done within uh, the main sounds in North Carolina um, and along some of the key uh, rivers. And so uh, the most sort of traditional historic forms of fishing for mullet in North Carolina have been gillnets, hulsanes, and pursanes. And for this talk, I'm primarily going to focus on the hulsanes and, and pursanes. Um, but I will discuss the gillnets somewhat. Um, so let's move into some of the early history. Uh, some of our earliest accounts of mullet are from explorers like John Lawson, who was one of the early explorers of the Carolinas. And he talked about mullet a little bit. He just said, there's a lot of mullet in the Carolinas, but it's nothing special because we have a lot of mullet in England too. Uh, so it's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, but prior to Lawson's accounts, we have accounts from other explorers who are visiting the Carolinas uh, in the fall of, 1663, you had a group of men traveled from Bermuda uh, to the Cape Fear region. And when they encountered the indigenous population there, they were presented with fish as gifts and they're presented with a lot of mullet for consumption. So we know the Native Americans were consuming mullet and we know that they were smoking them and drying them uh, to preserve them. Um, for later consumption, as well as so they could transport the fish. Um, we don't have a ton of accounts of the fishery from the colonial and federal periods. It tends to be more fragmentary documentation. So good examples are advertisements by merchants, uh, wills um, and estate records, um, sales of land that contain uh, mullet fisheries and, and maps. So uh, here's some examples. Uh, you have an advertisement 
uh, uh, by Joseph Bell, who is from Swansboro, and he was selling uh, salted mullet um, in Wilmington. And that was in 1805. And then here's an early map of um, Lenoxville, just outside of, of Beaufort here. And uh, on the map, I have this area circled in red where it says there's a fishery located right there. And there's other historical documentation that noted that there was a mullet fishery in Lenoxville. So that's probably where the mullet fishery was located. Um, you had a state sale um, from William Fisher who owned extensive property um, in uh, around like uh, Beaufort and Swansboro. Um, and when he died, his, his wife sold off a lot of his properties. Uh, amongst the properties was a part of a mullet saying, and this is probably referring to a share that he held with, uh, with a mullet saying. Uh, these mullet sayings were large, you know, a couple hundred yards in length, handmade from cotton twine, expensive, and a lot of people couldn't afford to outright be the sole owner of a mullet saying. So a group of men would tend to own um, the net and they would own a share in that net. Um, so this is probably a good way, time to segue into talking about um, the whole sayings um, on the beach fisheries and, and mullet camps. Um, so in around July, August, um, a captain of a mullet camp would assemble a crew, and this was a pretty informal process. He'd go around and try and find people who were willing to work with him. Um, then um, in around July, August, they would um, the men would move all the, the gear um, over to usually like a barrier island or some secluded location where they would fish. And they'd, they'd start setting up their gear out there. And one of the first things they would do is they would build the camp. And for the longest time, uh, the central part of the coast, usually from like uh, Ocracoke Inlet all the way down through uh, Onslow County, you would have these huts that were built out of reeds. Um, and uh, these huts were built probably up until the 1930s. Um, and so they're in use for a very long time. Uh, this photo, you've got this wheel that has um, uh, a net wound up on it, drying, and there's a couple of boats in the background. Um, the farther south you go, uh, usually around like Pender County, New Hanover, Brunswick County, um, they use shanties rather than these reed huts. And later on in Carteret County and other locations along the, uh, the central part of the coast, they also switched over to shanties because they're a bit more practical and comfortable. Um, after you establish your, your camp, oh, and I forgot to mention, one of the things they do with the camp is they would dig a well for a fresh water source. Um, then you would set up your boat close to the surf um, and get your nets ready. Then you'd establish a lookout. So a lot of times what they would do is they'd put men on top of dunes to watch for these fish schooling along the shoreline. Um, sometimes uh, they would build these sort of rudimentary towers that people could climb up and watch for the fish. And sometimes men were just walking up and down the beaches looking for fish. Um, when they spotted a school of mullet um, moving along the, the shoreline, um, they would launch a boat and you'd have a group of men stay on shore to sort of anchor one end of the net while men in the boat were paying out their seine in a semicircle along the shore. And then they would, uh, those men in the boat would land the other end of the net. And then everyone would start hauling it in. Um, oftentimes by hand, sometimes there's a horse or mule available to assist in hauling in that seine. Later on, they're using trucks. Uh, then the fish were landed on the beach and they would quickly start gathering them up into uh, buckets or um, baskets. And uh, the mullets were divided into shares. Um, and these, the share system uh, 
vary depending on location, time period, and it could vary from camp to camp. But here's an example of, of one share system that was used in Carter County. Um, the SANE received six to 10 shares. So the people who own the net were getting additional shares and that was going towards the maintenance, the upkeep of the net um, or even buying a new one. Uh, the boat received a share, really that's going towards maintaining um, the boat. Then you have the owner of the beach received three to 10 shares and the person who supplied food um, received one share. Although sometimes individuals responsible for supplying their own meals. And then the remainder was divided equally amongst the crew and the captain. Although in some instances, the captain received a double share because he's the guy who's in charge and has the most responsibility. Um, then they would clean the fish and they would either salt it with a coarse salt, um, or they would put it in a brine solution. So uh, a water solution that had a high salt content in it to preserve the fish. And this man in this photo packing fish um, into a barrel salted. And they have this tray where there's all this coarse salt. They're rubbing the fish down with. Um, in the fall, you have the, your female fish, which contain roe or eggs, which were highly prized, um, a delicacy to eat. Oftentimes the roe was more valuable than the fish itself, and they would salt and dry these as well. Um, so lifestyle out there, you have very limited bathing options. Men were often bathing out of buckets um, or pails. Sometimes they go out in the sound or the ocean to wash down. Um, the food was pretty basic, coffee, biscuits, sweet potatoes, cornmeal for making like cornbread that was pretty common, uh, salted pork, um, and all the fish you could eat. Um, sometimes if men had time, they would go um, and look for other fish to eat, or they'd go dig for clams in the sound. Um, and there's plenty of downtime at these camps because they're waiting around for the fish to come and they, they never know when the fish is gonna be there. Um, and so they'll try to entertain themselves, but there's also plenty of uh, chores such as uh, maintaining the nets um, and boats, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so now we'll, we'll just move into the, the antebellum period. Um, so who were the mullet fishermen? And it might, you might find it surprising that most of the mullet fishermen in North Carolina were actually farmers. Um, you might have a few uh, water, full-time watermen who were sort of in charge of the operation and organizing people and coordinating all the activities at these fisheries. But by and large, a lot of the labor was coming from agricultural communities. And so the mullet fishing was part of also part of an agricultural cycle in North Carolina. So while these guys have their crops planted and they're waiting to um, conduct a harvest, or they might have just conducted a harvest um, and they need employment year round and they need a food source year round, you know, they, they go and they work at these fishing camps for that. Um, and so for many of these guys, um, fishing is a secondary occupation um, and probably a really good example is I came across um, some instances in Brunswick County where they had um, tobacco crops that were so large that the mullet season started late in Brunswick County, not because the fish showed up late, but because they had so much tobacco that needed to be treated that the men just weren't available to go fishing. Um, so that's a good example, but an exception to this is a place like Carter County where agriculture wasn't as big. You had a lot more watermen, a lot more fishermen who were engaged in these activities uh, year round or engaged in a variety of fisheries year round. So during the antebellum period or in the 19th century, there was a social distinction in North Carolina commercial fishing operations. The mullet fishery was considered, was not considered a rich man's fishery um, because it's primarily conducted by people along the coast 
and the barrier islands where there's not as much rich agricultural land. Um, a good uh, point of comparison would be the shad and herring fisheries in North Carolina around the Albemarle region or around some of the large rivers like the, the Noose or the Cape Fear, where there's more rich agricultural lands, larger plantations, a lot more money, um, and so, um, and as well as slave labor. And so, um, you know, the, the, the shad and herring was a rich man's uh, fishery while mullet was not. And here's a good example. Here's, these are capital investments in commercial fishing operations in 1840. In the Albemarle region, people are investing tens of thousands of dollars in herring and shad fisheries, while in coastal communities like New Hanover and Onzo County, people are just investing hundreds. Um, and, a good and also 1850, you get more specific information. John Hewlett owned a mullet fishery in New Hanover County and he had a $200 capital investment in that fishery and he employed 19 men and produced about 250 barrels of fish valued at $900 a year. The Wood family, uh, which had plantations in Chong County, had a, a large fishery with a $5,000 capital investment and they had 40 men and 10 women, so 50 employees. And they were producing 1,200 barrels of fish valued at $6,000 annually. So there's some big differences there um, uh, in investment. Um, and then also just a good illustration, you've got a very small temporary fishery, reed huts compared to large um, fisheries uh, that are permanent structures um, on the Albemarle Sound. And, you know, a mullet seine could be a couple hundred yards length, a shad or herring seine on the Albemarle could be two miles in length. So some pretty big differences there. Also, the mullet fishery was part of a barter economy. Uh, so a lot of these guys who are fishing along the coast, they'd hire a middleman who owned a vessel, a sailing vessel, to go out and market their catch. Um, they These sailing vessels would go along the sounds and rivers of North Carolina and offering um, up uh, mullet at various landings, and generally um, the going rate was about five bushels of corn for every uh, barrel of mullet was generally how um, was the going rate for that period. There was also a cash market that had existed during the colonial period for mullet, but it really expanded during the antebellum period due to expansion in transportation. And you could, if you're um, inland and you open up one of these inland newspapers in North Carolina, you go to a section where they listed the, the, uh, the value of uh, the current value of a variety of, uh, of commodities like timber, turpentine, molasses, whatever. Um, and there's also mullet and other fish that were listed in there as well. Um, and that's because it's being sold uh, extensively throughout North Carolina's interior and it's it's being transported by steamboats up the like Cape Fear River um, to places like Fayetteville. It's going up the Noose River um, and other uh, rivers as well. Uh, then there's the railroads are expanding during this time period. Um, for instance, 1858, the railroad is brought into Moorhead City, um, uh, the, the old mullet line. Um, uh, and it goes down to where the port is today. And there is a correlation between the expansion of transportation and the expansion of com commercial mullet fisheries. Um, examples, Carter County, 1850. So before we got a railroad here, um, there's only one fish, commercial mullet fishery listed in the entire county. By 1860, there's five. Um, and um, eventually Carter and New Hanover counties um, dominate the mullet trade. Um, this became, because of access to both maritime and railroad transportation, uh, Carter County became number one. New Hanover County was number two. Um, and Onslow County did a lot of mullet fishing and they're kind of split between New Hanover um, uh, and Carter at the dividing line being 
uh, New River. If you're north of New River, uh, you're, you're going to Carter County. If you're south, you're going to Wilmington. Um, and Brunswick County was uh, fishing a lot of mullet as well that was going into Wilmington. Um, so uh, the mullet fishery has become uh, more prominent in real estate transactions you see during this time period. Uh, here's an example of a, a mullet fishery that's being advertised at Masonboro Inlet in New Hanover County. Um, and so now we're gonna transition into the post-Civil War era. I don't have a whole lot to say about mullet fishing during the Civil War, other than it was heavily disrupted due to uh, the Union occupying large portions of the coastline and the Union Army pretty much had control over the salt um, trade, which really prevented a lot of fishermen from getting salt in large quantities to preserve their fish. So the fishery kind of goes into a hiatus uh, during this time period. But following the Civil War, there's some developments in the malt fishery. You have a law that's passed by North Carolina le legislature regulating the size um, and nature of barrels that they're packed in. Um, prior to 1879, if you put in an order for a hundred mullet barrel or barrels containing mullet, you got barrels of all shapes and sizes and volumes, and there's no consistency. And so people got really upset because they felt cheated. Um, and so the legislature decided to standardize the size of barrels to 25 inches long by 13 inch diameter, which should hold about 100 pounds of mullet. Um, so if you'll order, uh, you know, um, you know, a, a barrel, one barrel is going to give you 100 every time, hopefully. But fishermen learned that they could kind of cheat the system. And depending on how they pack the fish, they could actually get 90 pounds of mullet in there. And hopefully none would be the wiser. Um, so uh, the, there were laws that dictated uh, fish barrels going all the way back to 1784 in North Carolina. And, and barrels were standardized only if you're going to export fish from the state. If you're trading um, fish uh, within North Carolina, this particular law in 1784 did not apply. So the majority of fish, a uh, mullet that were caught in North Carolina, about 90% were marketed within North Carolina. They didn't leave the state. They're marketed and consumed in North Carolina. So the old laws didn't apply. That's why they had to bring about this new law in 1879. Um, the, the, largely the fin fish that were being exported from North Carolina were shad and, and herring, and those were being heavily regulated uh, with that uh, 1784 barrel law. So, also, there's a whole concept of shipping mullet fresh on ice came into play in the 1870s in Beaufort. Um, and people decided that they liked fresh mullet a lot more than salted mullet. And the fishermen were able to get a better price for it. And it became really popular in Carteret and New Hanover counties. And uh, by the 1880s, Moorhead City had the largest ice house in North Carolina with schooners coming all the way down from New England with large blocks of ice um, that were cut out of ponds and lakes and they were stored in this ice house for the commercial fishing industry. Um, later on in the late 19th century, there is an ice manufacturing plant in Moorhead City. Uh, and during this time, the Atlantic and North Carolina Railroad, also known as the the old mullet line rose to prominence in exporting mullet from Moorhead City that was caught in Carteret County. And so I'm just going to highlight the locations of some of these fisheries. I'm not going to be able to look, do all of it because it's, it's not easy finding the exact locations of some of these. But we know at Cape Lookout, there was a mullet fishery at uh, Rec Point. Um, and inside the bite, there were mullet fisheries, and there's also an ice house um, in the late 19th century, and that there are schooners from Maine delivering ice to the bite to this particular ice house, which was owned by George Ives. And um, so they're catching fish at Cape Lookout, immediately icing it, 
putting it on boats bound for Moorhead City, which is then put on trains and shipped out from that location. Uh, Shackleford Banks had probably more than two mullet fisheries, but the two largest ones were actually on the sound side um, on the western end. Um, there's at least two fi mullet fisheries on Harker's Island. I'm not sure exactly where they were located, but I know that they were there due to sources. Um, there is several mullet fisheries within the vicinity of Beaufort. Uh, there's one at uh, 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 Bird Shoal, which was established in the 1850s uh, uh, by the Piver family, and they actually planted marsh grass to stabilize uh, the island um, for the fishery. And uh, there is a mullet fishery on Carrot Island as well as Lennoxville. Uh, there is a lot of mullet fisheries on Bogue Banks, and these red stars indicate where some of the largest and most popular ones were located, but there are more than just these. Um, and in Brunswick County, at the height of the mullet fishery in Lake Brunswick County, there is at least one mullet fishery for every two miles of ocean shoreline in Brunswick County. Um, and there's over 30 miles of shoreline there. Um, in the late 19th century, the landings in Carter County were, were so large that um, there were instances where the county ran out of salt in fish barrels. And they people ignored the barrel laws and were just grabbing any container they could to store mullet. And they were having these emergency sort of deliveries of salt coming in from New Bern by train. Um, and commercial fishing became so prosperous in Carter County that there was a housing boom in the mid 1880s where there's over a hundred houses built in Moorhead City alone in about a year or two. Um, in the 20th century, so now we're gonna move on to the 20th century. Um, and during this time period, there's a lot of tension between the Menhaden industry and the mullet fishery. Um, particularly um, all along the coast, but it, a lot of things really kind of heat up down in Brunswick County. Um, there's concerns about pollution coming out of the Menhaden factories, stick water, which is just all this blood and guts and all this nasty stuff that's an effluent coming out of um, these, these factories and going into the waterways. And mullet fishermen were complain, complaining and claiming that the stick water was chasing off the mullet. Um, and so in 1905, it became illegal to discharge fish off full blood or slime from Menhaden factories or boats in Brunswick County during mullet season. Um, and then in 1916, JF Bustles, who owned and managed Menhaden plants in Brunswick County, invented a filtration system for fish water, stick water, um, which was actually pretty beneficial because not only did it reduce pollution, but it, they also were able to produce more uh, Menhaden products um, from this filtered um, uh, effluent. Um, but you have the Persing controversy, which rages on for quite some time in the 20th century. Um, so um, you had these Menhaden companies that were going out, and when the Menhaden weren't running, but the mullet were, these companies started catching mullet with their purse seines and selling the mullet to fish dealers. Um, in 1905, uh, North Carolina made purse seining for mullet within three miles of Brunswick County illegal. Now this law had ex existed in cart for Carter County since the 1880s. And in the early 20th century, North, or Carter County had that grade, that law upgraded. Um, but this did not prevent the Ben Hayden boats from persaning for uh, mullet beyond the three mile limit. You go three miles out and that becomes federal waters. And so North Carolina can't regulate those waters. Um, and so the problem was with these giant persanes, you're catching way too many fish and the fish are spoiling before they can get back to shore to be preserved. Um, and sometimes they're catching fish that are too small to be legally sold. And so they're being used as fertilizer. And then um, you're also flooding the market with mullet, which is depressing the price because the supply exceeds the demand. Um, 
and there's also not enough mullet that are actually coming back to shore to be caught by the guys on the beach with those wholesanes. And so these, these wholesane fishermen are really upset with these purse snap fishermen. And there's also a fear of overfishing as a result. Uh, there's a good example of this in 1907, fall of 1907, uh, the Ruth J, which was owned by a conglomerate of fish dealers out of Wilmington, caught 40,000 pounds of mullet in one haul of a purse seine off Carolina Beach. Um, and they flooded uh, the Wilmington fish market. Um, and so as a result, Carter County, Onslow County, Pender, New Hanover counties uh, passed laws um, in the early 20th century to protect um, food fish from being caught with purse seines. So you could only catch menhaden, which is an industrial fish that you do not consume. Um, so you're limiting it per se, so just Manhattan. And then there's acts of violence that start to erupt throughout Eastern North Carolina um, in response to per se. And a good example is in October, 1912, uh, the George D. Bolster and the Charles S. Wallace, which were Manhattan uh, boats, were fired upon by fishermen from Bogue Banks. Um, and there was, the fishermen were claiming that these vessels were persaining too close to shore. Nobody got shot, but there's some near misses, you know, bullets sipping by people's heads. Um, World War I changes the rules because there needs to be more fish caught to feed the home front. So things like chickens and, um, you know, ch poultry, beef, and pork can be sent overseas to feed American troops as well as our allies. So these laws regulating the purse scenes are suspended. Um, and they're actually allowed to fish these purse scenes up to 500 feet from shore. And by 1920, it becomes illegal to take mullets and purse scenes, but um, a special rule is passed, um, a workaround. Uh, states the fisheries commissioner is hereby authorized and empowered to issue permits revocable at his pleasure upon the receipt of one dollar for issuing and recording to take mullet, bluefish, and mackerel with purse seines in the ocean not near than 300 yards to the beach or ocean shore. So they pass a special rule. Even though it's illegal to take mullets, you can give the fisheries commission, North Carolina Fisheries Commission, a dollar and you can actually go purse seine for them. Um, and so, so this stuff continues, 1922, it's illegal to take mullets um, uh, in person, except in Carter County where the Manhattan industry is the largest. Um, and this, this law, which you know, was passed by the legislature at the very last minute, it was so last minute that no one bothered to tell the fisheries commission about it. So they didn't get an opportunity to go educate people about this new law, which was their responsibility. And so you had some incidences that occurred such as the WA Mace, which was a Menhaden boat from Carter County was arrested by the sheriff of Pender County for taking mullet um, and a purse saying, um, near shore. Uh, the case winds up getting dismissed in court because they didn't know any better because no one bothered to tell the fisheries commission and the fisheries commission responsible for telling all these, you know, these purse seine fishermen about the law. So, you know, they, they're let off with basically a warning. Um, and so there's all these questions, you know, raging about like, how should North Carolina regulate its mullet fishery? And so they decide that, well, we need more scientific information. We need to know more about the fish and its life cycle and its spawning habits. And, and, and they're like, we've got all these, these sea mullets, which they're at the time calling Cape mullets. And they're like, do they come from Virginia? We don't really know much about them. And like, do North Carolina mullets, do they migrate to Florida in the fall? Because we see them heading south and we know that Florida at the time had the largest mullet fishery in the United States and North Carolina had the second largest mullet fishery. And there's all these connections between North Carolina in Florida in terms of, of mullet fishing. Um, and there's like, do North Carolina mullets, if they go to Florida, do they come back? You know, there's all these, these questions that are coming about. And so uh, in, the, in the mid twenties, you have the Bureau of Fisheries um, 
decides to conduct some scientific investigations to hopefully answer some of these questions. And the, the lab on Pybers Island is involved. Um, and they, there's these studies that compare and contrast mullet that are found in North Carolina and Florida. And they actually tag mullet in both North Carolina and Florida and release them uh, to try and figure out where they're going. Um, and 10,000 are caught and re released here in Beaufort. And then uh, in 1926, they repeat these experiments. Um, and so what they found was that North Carolina and, and Florida mullets were actually from are two different varieties. They're, they're closely related, but there's some differences in them. And that they found there's no intermingling between the stocks. So they're not migrate. North Carolina, Carolina mullet aren't going all the way down to Florida. The farthest south they're going was South Carolina. And most of the tagged mullet were being found actually in North Carolina. Uh, so they, most of them stay here. Um, and they didn't have time to figure out what was going on with these Cape mullets or these sea mullets, which are actually kingfish. But um, they, they don't really get a chance to figure this out because the Great Depression happens in 1928. And there's priorities in terms of federal funding and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the federal government basically tells the state of North Carolina that we don't really know what to tell you in terms of regulating your fishery because there's such these huge natural fluctuations within the mullet population um, in North Carolina because they're sensitive to things like climate change and or just just changes in in day-to-day -day climate conditions and there's these um, you, we haven't quite figured out where these cape mullet are coming from so we don't know what to tell you about them and these regul and you know the if we if you do the regulations that we're suggesting which was a closed season on mullet it's going to fall disproportionately on the shore-based fisheries because North Carolina can't regulate beyond the three mile limit. So these Menhaden boats can still go out there and, and get mullet as they're spawning offshore. So um, nothing really happens. Um, and these boats continue to go offshore. And in September 6, 1927, hundreds of thousands of mullet are landed by Menhaden boats uh, in Beaufort and Moorhead City. Um, and I'm sure that just destroyed the mullet season in terms of prices. Um, and it continued into the Great Depression uh, when people really needed their money the most. Um, they're flooding the market with it. And there's this one instance where the Deutschland, uh, which was a Menhaden boat, actually caught a ton of uh, lo lots of mullet. And the net snagged on like a wreck, it tore and it had all these dead mullet washed up along Shackleford boat banks. And just the mullet, the beach mullet fishermen were just not happy at all. Um, and you have Jimmy Guthrie of Harker's Island in 1934 wrote, during the summer, while we wait, the purse man is doing his stunts. He is piling up his money by catching fat backs. But when the blow comes, the purse sane man is permitted to fall in and just wipe us off the face of the earth, ruin the market, ruin the dealer, and ruin the little fishermen, their families, and their schools. So the fishermen are complaining that they can't make a living because these purse sane boats are just flooding the market with fish. During the Great Depression, when people really needed every cent. And so um, in September 1934, a group of local commercial fishermen plotted to destroy purse scenes of two Menhaden boats, the Kingfisher and Sickle, and uh, they're successful. And it was a $3,000 loss in purse scenes. Um, nobody got caught, nobody got in trouble. Um, and they did this because the price of mullets had fallen to less than a penny per pound. Um, and just, it wasn't even worth going out and trying the fish. Now, one of the things that arose during the Great Depression where they tried to, to, to answer this problem with mullet flooding the market was the North Carolina Fisheries Incorporated, which was a cooperative um, commercial fishing uh, movement within North Carolina that was based out of Moorhead City, but had branches all throughout Eastern North Carolina. And in Moorhead City, 
uh, the co-op had a quick freeze plant where the idea was um, they could free, when they had these gluts of fish, they could freeze the fish. And then uh, when uh, prices got better, they could release that frozen fish onto the market. They also brought people down from New England to show people better ways of processing and packaging fish. Um, and the idea was that they're gonna sell this fish to North Carolina grocery stores in the interior. Um, and so during this time period where the North Carolina Fisheries Incorporated is operating, the state is flirting with the idea of loosening up these per se laws even more um, all along the North Carolina coast. And they wanna bring in per sains within the three mile limit to take food fish. And they also wanna open up the three mile limit to out of state trawlers as well, um, which was just a terrible idea. And so um, the, uh, the mullet fishermen go to the North Carolina Fisheries Incorporated and they ask, where do you stand on this issue of per sains in the three mile limit? And the John Sykes, who is the president and general manager of the, um, uh, the co-op, um, he publicly advocated the use of purse sayings. He said, this was a great idea. And he said, in fact, the, the co-op is trying to buy its own trawlers to go out and purse sane for, for mullet and other food fish. And, uh, you know, the, these fishing methods uh, used by North Carolina commercial fishermen. They're antiquated, they're old fashioned. You really need to adopt these methods. Uh, they're used by New England fishermen, that kind of thing. And uh, people didn't like that. Um, and uh, he had to resign a couple months later after making these public statements. Um, there's some other reasons why he had to resign, but this was one of the, the, the straws that broke the camel's back. Um, so the Perstein laws uh, weren't loosened up again until 1942 with uh, the United States entering World War II and that need for lots of food fish to be committed to the home front um, so other foods can be committed um, to U.S. troops overseas. Um, one of the interesting things that did happen in the late 30s and early 40s was the state prison system established a a mullet fishery on Holden's Beach in Brunswick County. And they populated that fishery with uh, commercial fishermen who were in jail. Um, and they're at a prison camp in Supply, uh, North Carolina, which is also in Brunswick County. And um, the, the fish caught were um, distributed to all the, the prisons within the North Carolina prison system. Um, and it was actually a very successful operation. Um, and there's actually an interesting story that comes out of this fishery. Uh, you have a guy by the name of Johnny Varnum, who's a Brunswick County fisherman, 1932, he's convicted of manslaughter. And in 1937, he's assigned to work at this fishery. And, um, you know, he had killed two people. And that summer of 1937, there's a family that gets sucked out in a rip current, some tourists, and he, rescues these people and um, his sentence as a result is commuted. Um, so it's a pretty interesting story there. Um, the state of North Carolina prison system engaging in commercial fishing and is supposedly the only commercial fishing operation in North Carolina that kept 100% of its catch in state. Um, also another interesting that happened in the late 1930s was um, mullet farming uh, by the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries um, both right here on Parvers um, Island. Um, they built a pond, a WPA and the state of North Carolina built this pond out there to farm mullet. And the experiment was, conduct, was conducted by Dr. Prithrich. And they wanted to see if you could raise mullet in captivity for human consumption. And they found, yes, you can do it. Um, and Prithrich was like, we kind of already knew we could do it because the Europeans and the ancient Egyptians had done it successfully. We just kind of wanted to see if we could do it here in the US. Um, and so it's, but it's interesting. Um, and so there's all these changes 
uh, within the mullet fishery that start happening after World War II. You know, after the war, there's all these jobs, there's higher wages. And so people are more reluctant to engage in, you know, fishing for mullet at these fisheries along the shoreline. And so these crews start to shrink. And because there's less manpower, they have to become more efficient. So they start using trucks to haul in um, their, their, their seines and they're using motorized uh, dories to, to put their, their nets out. Um, and by this time, 95% of mullets caught in North Carolina are marketed fresh and on ice. So there's also a change in the palate of North Carolinians and the palate of Americans. They want less salted food and more fresh food. Um, also, um, in the late 20th century, you know, you've got um, stop netting um, is developed. Uh, it's a more efficient uh, way of, of, of wholesaling on the beaches um, in North Carolina. It's, it's a system that's unique to Bogue Banks. So with it, you have this L-shaped uh, sort of fence of netting that goes out um, into the water and uh, the fish run into it and they're sort of corralled into this area and then they deploy their whole seine to just sort of scoop the fish in from this area where all the fish are, are gathering. Um, in North Carolina, this happens in October and November. And uh, here's some photos, I think, I think about the 70s or 80s um, of this happening here in Boat Banks with farm tractors. Also, um, in, by the 1970s, um, the, the whole scene on the, the beach goes into decline and gill netting becomes much more prominent in North Carolina for catching it. Uh, for instance, uh, you have runaround gill netting, which is you have a gill net which is deployed um, from a boat, which you encircle your schools of fish with, with gill nets out in water. So it, it's a near shore fishery, which can also be conducted out in the sounds. And you also, you have set gill nets um, are used, which you're, you're anchor your gill nets. There's also drift gill nets, which aren't used quite as, as much. Um, and uh, gill netting also further expanded in the 90s with an influx of Florida fishermen that came to North Carolina following uh, gill net closures um, in Florida. Um, late 80s and or in the 80s and 90s, you had an increase resurgence in the fishery. Um, this is largely due to a demand for mullet roe from the Asian market. Um, and so, in the late 80s, the the landings increased by 18 percent. And usually, when you have large increases in your landings, your prices are going to go down. But not in this case. Your the prices actually went up by 150 percent because the demand was so high. Um, things dropped off in the late 90s, possibly because of a depressed Asian economy, and also possibly due to increased competition from other sectors. Um, but landings stabilized in the early 2000s. Um, in the 90s, there's a lot of tensions with the mullet fishery. There's, you've got different groups of commercial fishermen who um, are kind of coming into to a clashing with each other, but you're also having a lot of commercial and recreational fishermen that are clashing. A lot of it, it's due to space. Um, and this causes the fishery to be further regulated. Um, but despite everything that the mullet fishery has been through in North Carolina, it's still a healthy fishery. Um, and North Carolina has the largest mullet fishery on the Atlantic seaboard of the United States. Um, and in, is still very much part of North Carolina culture. You have Swansboro Mullet Festival in October, and you also have uh, the mullet bucket, uh, the, the football rivalry between East and West Carteret High Schools here in Carteret County, which takes place in the fall. Um, and so that's everything I have for y'all. Um, do y'all have any questions about any of this? Yes, ma'am. So um, with the mullet fishery, 
uh, be a couple hundred yards. It depends on the regulations at the time, but um, it, they can be a few few hundred yards in length. Um, it that can depend on the depth of the water that these guys are operating in, but I I can't remember off the top of my head the depth in that. Yeah. Um, another question I had um, when they decided that they couldn't put the wolf uh, in mm -hmm. the water, what were they doing? So they so all that that fish slime and and and, and blood. Um, it, it it it's a filtration system where I can't remember it off the top of my head, um, but it's the, the, there's there's an industrial process where it's basically you've got all this the stuff that's condensed down into a cake like material, um, and that's what's what's left over, and that can actually sell it um, as a product. I th I think they use it in like animal feed. Yeah. Yeah. It, what, what's also interesting about that filtration system is that it it pops up in Brunswick County, like sort of during the the, the World War One era, but it doesn't come up in the Carter County until the 40s. So I don't know if that technology was proprietary and, you know, uh, withheld from, you know, the, the rest of the industry for a while. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Brunswick County kind of had that going on for a while. Um, any other questions? Is there any questions from people online? Can't. I'm trying to find how I access the comments. David, nothing online. That's okay. Easy. Okay. Um, I'm gonna check Facebook. Yes, sir. So, what does the mullet feed on? What they feed on, uh, yeah, they they fall, they'll feed on microorganisms, uh, 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 dead organic matter. Um, they're they're basically bottom feeders. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions? So they kind of similar to like pickled herring if you're putting it in wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a similar it's a similar preservation system. Hey, yeah. David, we've got one question on Zoom. Yep. Uh, Lawrence wants to know what is the dollar value of the mullet industry today? Oh the gosh. Industry today. I, I you know what? I, I neglected to look at what the, the most recent dollar value of it is today, but I'll tell you it's not nearly as big as it used to be because it's primarily a row fishery. They're they're primarily going out for the row. Uh, today, um, and it, it's yeah, it's it's a much smaller fishery. Yeah, I pretty much focused on the the early twenty, the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. My research. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much, David. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you.